Hey everybody, how's it going? Welcome to No DQ and A video right here on NoDQ.com as well as the YouTube channel and NoDQ and A videos affiliate ringsidenews.com. Before I get started with the questions, real quick, I want to give a cheap plug. NoDQ.com t shirts and NoDQ and A video t shirts are available at ProWrestlingTees.com. You could check out the link in the description box. I mention this because right now they have a 4th of July week sale. Enter the code AMERICA when you check out and you get 20% off of your order. So go ahead and grab a NoDQ.com t-shirt or a no DQ and a video t-shirt help support the website get one if you haven't already or get a second one maybe every little bit helps grab a t-shirt tell a friend and thank you all for the support now with that being said let's get down to your questions today regarding raw and other topics first one today comes from Vinny Seth Rollins mentioned Roman Reigns suspension does this mean it's a storyline Believe it or not, I did get a lot of questions about this. A lot of people are curious as to why WWE brought up the Roman Reigns suspension and made such a big deal out of it. I guess some people were thinking maybe WWE would just have Michael Cole address it on commentary real quick and then move on, but they actually did a full segment with Seth Rollins, complete with him showing Titantron footage of Roman Reigns' tweet apologizing. It was definitely not a storyline. I think what WWE wanted to do here was garner sympathy for Roman Reigns. The way Seth Rollins cut his promo, he was just putting down Roman Reigns. And you had Dean Ambrose coming out saying that everyone makes mistakes. The way the whole promo was written, the whole segment was written, it felt like WWE was trying to get people behind Roman Reigns and have sympathy for the guy. Will it work? Probably not. I think that WWE is going to have a rude awakening when Roman Reigns comes back at Battleground. I think people are going to boo the guy out of the building. They will continue booing him out of the building. And nothing is going to change because of this suspension. If anything, people are going to boo him even more now because they feel that this guy got the opportunity to be on top and he screwed up. And now he's even less deserving of having that top spot. I do not see the suspension doing Roman any favors and certainly not getting him some sympathy from fans. This next one comes from Brett. What do you think the deal is with Xavier Woods about the Wyatt family? He's acting strange. What do you think? This is another question that I got a lot of people asking me coming off of Raw. One thing that was very noticeable about that segment was Xavier Woods seemed to be afraid of the Wyatt family. And I think that's really that it is to that segment. I think the idea is that you have Kofi and Big E making jokes and being funny, but it's Xavier who really does feel that these guys are a serious threat. And I think that that's a good thing. I think you need to have this kind of dynamic in the storyline because the Wyatt family, they need to be taken seriously. They're, they're not... Co comedy heels and with Xavier Woods acting like that it helps give the Wyatt family some credibility it makes the whole storyline a little bit more credible and it's not all fun and games and it's something that these guys really need to be serious about so I actually think it's a nice touch to this storyline and some people are speculating that maybe this will lead to Xavier Woods turning on Big E and Kofi. I highly doubt that. I would be very surprised if that happened. It would not make any sense for Xavier to turn at this point and for New Day to break up with the brand split would be a huge mistake. There's no need to break that group up right now and I think that having Xavier Woods join the Wyatt family would not make any sense whatsoever. So I think it's just the idea that one of the New Day members actually does see these guys as a serious threat and that will help carry the storyline moving forward. Got this one here from Marcus S. What was your reaction to Kane being the Miz's mystery opponent on Raw tonight? That was pretty much my reaction and I think everyone else watching felt the same way. A lot of people were thinking 
it's going to be somebody huge, like Randy Orton coming back, or even Neville coming back, or Finn Balor making his main roster debut. But of course, it was Demon Kane, and nobody cared. Nobody in that crowd gave a damn about Kane. We're in the new era now, and it seemed like guys like Kane and Big Show were being phased out. And sure, Big Show coming out there for the Special Olympics segment is fine. Kane doing a backstage segment to pitch a general manor, manager role for SmackDown, that's fine. But for Kane to actually come out and have a TV match, and apparently there's going to be a few now because Miz lost. He got counted out, and I guess they're going to have a match on pay-per-view. I'm not really sure what to make of that one, other than it's really not necessary at this point. Kane... I hate to say it because Kane's one of the all-time great characters in WWE, but it's time to call it a career, and Kane just feels so out of place in WWE right now, and, uh, you know, the, the corporate Kane stuff is funny if they want to do a segment every now and then with him making a cameo, but um, I think they're, they're going a little bit too far by having him come out there and get involved in a feud with The Miz. I mean, it really must just show that WWE has no idea what to do with Miz as IC champion, that they're just bringing back Kane for this instead of building up a new star to feud with The Miz. I'm really not sure. Like I said, I have no idea what to make of this. This one comes from Sasha Banks Guy. Who do you think wins the IC title off of The Miz? I was thinking either Neville or Apollo Crews. Definitely not Kane, hopefully. Hopefully. You never know with WWE. I think Neville would be a good choice. I think he might be the best choice, actually, because when Neville comes back, it would be nice for him to have some kind of momentum, and I think him beating The Miz would be a good way to elevate him right off the bat after coming back. I could even see Randy Orton coming back. I know some people have considered the idea of Randy Orton coming back and winning the IC title and having a similar run to John Cena where Orton elevates the, the IC title, which I, I really do not feel is the best way to utilize Orton at this stage of the game. I think Orton should be going right in there with guys like Brock Lesnar and top tier guys. Um, I, I really do feel Neville would be the best choice and he's coming back and the timing seems good for Neville to come in and win the IC title and give him a run with the title and let him, let him feud with Miz for a while over the title. That, that seems to be a good direction. And maybe that is a direction that WWE is planning on and Kane is just simply a filler match for The Miz or a filler feud until Neville is ready to come back. This one comes from Simon Lee. Is it normal that WWE keeps mentioning the WWE World Heavyweight title as the WWE title as they are teasing a world title return? I got so many questions about this. This is another one that people have been asking me about and speculating about. Even Jeff tweeted me about it, or actually I think he sent me a regular text message. I'm, I'm so used to the tweets now. But yeah, a lot of people noticed that and that seems to be an indication that WWE is going in that direction with two world titles again. The fact that they're calling it the WWE title now instead of the WWE World Heavyweight Championship. A lot of people noticed it, and I really do not think that it was a coincidence with the brand split coming up soon. This one comes from Jishnu. Hey Aaron, who do you think Chris Jericho would be feuding with at SummerSlam coming soon? That's another interesting question. I, I would like to see Chris Jericho versus Sami Zayn at SummerSlam. I think that that would be an awesome match and let Jericho get a good feud out of Sami Zayn and let those two go back and forth. I think that we even saw a little bit of a tease on Raw with Sami Zayn and Kevin Owens putting their differences aside to shut Jericho up with a super kick. And Jericho can always come back and use that as a reason to come after Sami Zayn. So you have a built-in reason for those two to feud now. I, I'd love to see that. I would love to see a Jericho-Sami Zayn feud heading into SummerSlam, or even Jericho versus Neville. Neville wins the IC title. You can have Jericho and Neville feud for a while. There's a lot of different possibilities, but you know, I think Jericho is best used as a guy that can work with the younger talent and elevate those guys. So whether it's Neville 
or Sami Zayn or Cesaro. Those are the guys that I think Jericho should be working with at this stage of the game. Got this one here from Izzy5234. Hey Aaron, with the supposed leaked pay-per-view schedule, what are your thoughts on Clash of Champions? How would it play out in WWE? This seems to be really silly. I do not even understand the point in renaming Night of Champions Clash of Champions. I think the only reason they're doing it is maybe to draw in some of the older fans and, and get them invested in either subscribing to the network or at least sampling it with the Clash of Champions pay-per-view. I mean, I always thought that bringing back Great American Bash was weird. I mean, if you're going to bring back a WCW name, why not bring back Halloween Havoc? I mean, that was a cool name. You can do it in October. Um, even Starcade you could bring back. Although Starcade is like WCW's WrestleMania, and I think that that would just be weird. But of all the names, I, I would bring back Halloween Havoc. I think Clash of Champions for a pay-per-view to replace Night of Champions doesn't really seem to serve much of a purpose. That's just my take on it. This one comes from Your Grace. Hey Aaron, if Seth Rollins were to get a new finisher, what would you want it to be? I like the superplex slash falcon arrow move. I agree with you. I think that that would be a nice combo finisher for Seth Rollins and he can even do the superplex first and then sometimes guys can counter the Falcon Arrow, I think that that would be a, a very solid choice for a new finisher. I think that if Seth Rollins was going to stay a heel long term, which I do not see happening, I, I think it's foolish for him to be a heel right now, and especially if there's going to be a feud with Triple H, I could see them feuding and Seth Rollins getting a new finisher anyways, but let's just say if Seth Rollins was going to stay a heel, I'd like to see him use the power bomb into the turnbuckle since that was the move that pretty much ended Sting's career and Seth Rollins could take credit for that, a move that, that is so devastating that it, it was the final nail in Sting's coffin and Seth could run with that. But, you know, that that's in a, in, in a whole different situation. Right now, I think Seth Rollins needs to be babyface and... Um, yeah, I, I like your choice there with the superplex into the Falcon Arrow just because it's very flashy and uh, there's lots of different ways it can be countered and I think that that would add a lot of interest to his matches and, and the false finishes and all that. This one comes from RDX. Have you checked out the podcast with Benoit's sister-in-law? What are your thoughts or if it even happening at all? I have not listened to the podcast yet. I did read the recap of it, and uh, I, I think it does add a lot of unanswered questions. Not all of the unanswered questions, but there were some things she said that weren't really out there. Stuff about Chris Benoit having issues with roid rage going back to 2004, and the depression and I mean we knew that he was upset about Eddie Guerrero's passing but you know it paints a picture and and all the stuff about him and Nancy having problems before I mean it does fill in the pieces of the puzzle it does make the picture more clear but we still don't know everything and we never will know 100% of the story what really happened uh, but I do, I do feel it's very intriguing, and everyone should check out that podcast and uh, at least check out the recap. Very interesting stuff about Benoit, and uh, you know the whole thing is just very tragic to know that Chris Benoit had all these issues, and maybe something could have been done to prevent all that from going down. Maybe he could have stepped away from the business. Who knows if if he could have gotten help and could have just been able to live a, a lengthy life and, and none of that stuff would have happened. I mean, just very tragic. That That's all I can say about it. All right, this one comes from Ryan Kurtz, or Quartz. Nice intro for your videos. Glad somebody liked it. During the brand split, what year was the best SmackDown and what year was the best Raw? For SmackDown, I would say definitely 2003, with Paul Heyman running creative for SmackDown. The show really peaked in 2003, and I definitely feel SmackDown was a more compelling show than Raw during that period. For Raw, I would say either 2005 or 2006. You know, Raw really started to 
get into high gear in 2005 when Batista and Triple H started feuding and then John Cena came to Raw. Raw really started clearly becoming the A-show once again. Although, I would say by 2004 that was already happening. SmackDown's quality, in my opinion, went downhill after that 2004 um, draft. And 2006 was another good year for Raw with the, the DX reunion and, and John Cena versus Edge, the live sex celebration. Lots of interesting stuff during that year as well. And, and let's not forget the whole ECW invasion leading up to the One Night Stand pay-per-view both years, 2005 and 2006. And uh, in 2005, the, the Gold Rush tournament and Shawn Michaels feuding with Hulk Hogan. Uh, so yeah, I would say either 2005 or 2006 were the best brand extension years for Raw. Got this one here from Sean T. Flick. Due to the brand split, do you think Charlotte versus Sasha Banks takes place at Battleground instead of SummerSlam? That's an interesting question because some feel that WWE's jumping the gun on the Shield match because they want to do the match before the brand split and you know another reason why WWE's doing Sami Zayn versus Kevin Owens since the brand split's coming up and there's a good chance those two will be separated but I think that it's best to just save the Sasha Banks versus Charlotte match for SummerSlam. I mean they already waited long enough. It should have been done at WrestleMania. If we're going to wait on it, then do it right and let it happen at SummerSlam in Brooklyn, the one-year anniversary of the Sasha banks Bailey match. I think that that would be a suitable place, a very suitable place for her to finally end Charlotte's reign of terror as the women's champion. Um, at Battleground, it wouldn't nearly have as much impact, and yeah, Shield at SummerSlam would have more impact, but... With the brand extension with three guys involved in the mix, uh, I, I think it was best to do that match now. But Charlotte and Sasha Banks, I think, should be saved until SummerSlam. Draft them both to the same show or have the women's champion appear on both shows or whatever they're going to do. That'll wrap it up for this edition of No DQ and a No video. Thanks, as always, for watching. Subscribe if you haven't already at youtube.com slash Aaron Rift No DQ. Subscribe to my personal channel at youtube.com slash Aaron Rift. Stay tuned to NoDQ.com for the very latest regarding the Battleground pay-per-view and the brand extension. Keep sending in your questions to twitter.com using the hashtag PAIV. And on that note, I will see you guys next time for another edition of NoDQ&A video.